It is good to see Rick back there in the back, as, as Kemper mentioned. I'm not a preacher, uh, so you're not going to get a sermon this morning. I just want to talk about some absolute truths, some things that are true, undeniable, and they're really no conversation about. They're just the absolute truth. So I want to talk about that. Come next week and you can hear somebody preach because Rick will be back. I did want to start out this morning with confession about an addiction I have. And you saw that in your notes. And, uh, you know, 2023 is about gone. And 2024 is coming fast. The winter holiday season is about over. You know, the, the, the stockings were stuffed and the turkeys were stuffed. And my stomach was stuffed <laughs> way beyond what it should have been. And I know I'm guilty of eating too much sometimes. But the problem is, is Brenda makes the absolute best peanut butter fudge in the entire world. <laughs> I mean the absolute best. And I'm addicted to it. I am just truly addicted to it. Now, I know I shouldn't eat more than, I don't know, a pound or so of peanut butter fudge at a time. <laughs> but after my heart surgery, I lost 20 pounds. And the doctor said, he said, I want you to be on a high calorie diet. So I said, heck, I'll eat this peanut butter fudge. And that's a high calorie diet, right? Maybe I shouldn't eat it three times a day. The really sad part is I had to pay a $20 copay to become an addict. It's, uh, it's really bad. But next time I'm going to take him bring his fudge. That'll teach him a lesson. But you know, the truth is I probably need to eat fudge in a little bit different way. As much as I love it, I need to just do it differently. So I'm going to start a new journey with peanut butter fudge. I'm going to start a new beginning with peanut butter fudge. Maybe a New Year's resolution is the answer. I don't know. Maybe that's it. Maybe, just maybe, I'll resolve not to eat more than a pound of peanut butter fudge at a time. You th maybe that's good. After all, you know, New Year's resolutions are a time to make commitments. It's a time to make decisions. It's a time often to go in a new direction or declare things that we're going to do and we're going to do differently. So, here we go, church. I resolve and I declare to Concord Baptist Church that I will not eat more than one half pound of peanut butter fudge at a time. I think that should do it. That should help anyway. I'm just trying to be biblical in my approach. <laughs> I, I mean, I really am. The Bible calls us to declare things that are important to us. And I just want to follow scripture is all I want to do. You know, Bob wants to do the same thing. I appreciate Bob singing this morning. I call him Lord. Thank you, Bob. I've known Bob for over 20 years. I know his heart and his soul. And most people think Bob likes to sing. He sings in church. He sings in nursing homes. I've heard him out in the parking lot, apparently singing to his pickup truck because nobody else was around. <laughs> but the truth is that Bob loves to declare who Jesus is. And he chooses to do it through music. You know, Psalm 71, 8 tells us, My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendor all day long. Bob has made a strong resolution, a determination, and a resolve to declare who Jesus is to you through music. You know, we're all called to do that. Romans 10, 9 tells us if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This declaration is the only path to salvation. Make no mistake about it. This is a fact. I pray today that you've made that decision. If not, you certainly need to. But there's also a call for Christians to declare Jesus as Lord. Isaiah tells us to shout it from the mountaintops. In Hebrews, it tells us, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer praise to God and sacrifice the fruitful lips that openly profess his name. Bob's lips are fruitful in praise. Ours need to do this as well. Our lips need to be fruitful. But you know, in order to receive the salvation that God offers through Jesus Christ, or to sing it from the mountaintops like Bob, you must first decide who Jesus really is. It's a personal decision that should be based on facts, not on opinion, not on hearsay, but on facts. So the question today, who do you say Jesus is? This is the most important question ever asked of mankind. Amen. 
and everyone on the planet believes something about God. They believe something about Jesus. But who do you say Jesus is? You know, there's all sorts of opinions people have. Lots of opinions. Lots. Our scripture today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. If you want to turn there, I'll be reading. And this scripture is as reverent today as it was the day it was written. But first, let me give you some facts. Let me give you a little background of where we are in leading up to this section in Matthew. Now, here's some absolutes, and here are some truths. Undeniable truths, undeniable facts. So before we get to where Jesus is asking the disciples a question, he declared that the kingdom of God is at hand, and it is at hand. He finished the Sermon on the Mount, which was teaching the principles of God's kingdom, how we're to live, the Beatitudes, the blessings that we have, and the different ways we're supposed to live our lives. He healed many people. The centurion servant, Peter's mother-in-law, he healed them. He healed the blind, the lame, the sick, and the lepers. And he cast out demons. I mean, Jesus cast out demons. And he answered the many questions from the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He answered their questions. And he raised the dead. Wow. I mean, Jesus brought people back to life. He walked on water. He fed the 5,000. He fed the 4,000 with a few fish and a few loaves of bread. You know, I could really just end right here. Because that tells us all. That's the truth, people. I mean, that, that is the absolute truth. And that's what we should be basing what we do and what we're dependent on. I do not understand the confusion and the false opinions about who Jesus really is. It's just hard for me to comprehend. I base my whole life on facts. Uh, people will tell you that I have, I have two traits. One good trait is I tell the truth. My uh, bad trait is I tell the truth. <laughs> and, I, and I sometimes do that forcefully and without regard because you know, we only have a limited time sometimes, so the truth is important. So here we go. We're getting to our scripture. Jesus asked the disciples two questions. And he's asking us the same questions today. So Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? Now the Son of Man is the title that Jesus gave himself and humility, to show his humility. They replied, some said John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you Simon of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You know, all throughout Scripture, Jesus asked a lot of questions, didn't he? I mean, if you look throughout the Scripture, he asked a lot of questions. And he oftentimes answered a question with a question. And it's not that Jesus didn't already know the answer. It was one of his methods of teaching. And his point was for us, for you and me, to access our level of faith and our level of understanding of the truth and assess the truth that was shown to us and the truth has been shown to us here that Jesus was the Son of God, the chosen one, to redeem us from our sin. The evidence bears it out. You know, I got an attorney over at Kemper Beasley, just a great attorney. And Kemper, I'll tell you, if you were on the outside of this, I believe I could, I believe I could win this court battle right here because the evidence bears it out. I would, I'd hope you would just sit back and say, you know, you're right. You're absolutely true. Everything I'm going to say is just based on opinion and hearsay and, and whatnot, but the facts are here. It was prophesied for years. Thousands of years it was prophesied. But it was revealed through the words and the actions of Jesus. Today, as in biblical times, so many people miss the truth. They miss the truth. First, Jesus asked the disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? This is a question about public opinion, just public opinion. 
They replied, some said John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others still one of the prophets. You know, when you look at the news today, I don't know if you're a CNN fan or a Fox News fan, there's opinions. There's opposing opinions. There's opinions about everything. And most of them are wrong. They're based on what we want ourselves. They're based on how we want to see the world, and maybe not how the world is. They're not based on facts. They're just based on a lot of different things. I think about Chris King, my good friend out there doing the sound system thing. Chris, don't cut me off. He, uh, Chris is of the opinion that the Pittsburgh Steelers will win a Super Bowl in his lifetime. <laughs> now, I will tell you, Chris, if, you, if you're like Methuselah and you live to be 969 years old, that might happen. But other than that, it's not. Rick, same thing for you Virginia Tech fans in a national football championship. It's just not going to happen. You're, you're basing that opinion, you're basing that thought, and you're basing that on something that you want and maybe not something that's the truth. These opinions about Jesus were honorable. John the Baptist, well, if you're familiar with scripture at all, John the Baptist just had his head cut off. It was laid on a platter. This wasn't John the Baptist. King Herod thought that maybe he'd been resurrected. Some say Elijah or Jeremiah. Elijah, Elijah's coming. The scriptures tell us that he's coming that great and terrible day. Well, the great day was when Jesus was born. That great and terrible day is the second coming. You don't have to be part of that terrible day. I'm here to tell you the facts that you don't have to be. The facts bear out that it was not John the Baptist. It was not one of the prophets. You know, the very people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the educators of Scripture, the so-called experts, I don't know who you're going to for your opinions, but go to the expert. It's a written word of God. Go to Jesus for it. They missed it. They missed who Jesus was. They had a head knowledge. They could quote the scripture. They knew the prophets. They could tell you the, I don't know, there was a couple thousand laws. They could quote the laws. But they missed the full fulfillment and the true meaning of what they were teaching. They had false self-expectations. I don't know what your expectation of Jesus is, but don't base it on what you want it to be. Base it on what God wants it to be. Now, Jesus puts a little twist in the question here. He asked the disciples, but what about you? Who do you say I am? This is not a question about public opinion. It's not what the world thinks. It's not what I think. It's not what Pastor Rick thinks. It's a personal question that God is asking you today. He's asking the same question. Have you made that strong determination? Have you made that re resolution to accept who Jesus is? Are you declaring the truth? Or are you declaring public opinion? You know, your opinion about Jesus might be based on the same things that the scribes and Pharisees were and the people in that region on the teachings of the Bible, on the scripture. And it very well should be. We should study the Bible. We should seek to understand scripture. And we should seek to realize who Jesus is through facts. And it's through a personal relationship with him. It's a heart knowledge made into wisdom that reveals who Jesus is. It's a strong resolve, it's a determination based on humble beginnings, that Jesus is the Messiah. It's the starting point. It's the foundation upon which the church was built. You know, it's only after Peter declared that Jesus was the Messiah could Jesus really begin to teach them and they begin to understand his death and resurrection. We oftentimes try to fill our heads with all this knowledge and understand everything. But sometimes it's a humble beginning. Understand that Jesus is the Lord. He's the Messiah. He's the chosen one. It was only after that, only after Peter declared it, could they begin to truly understand. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's the truth. It's not an opinion. Jesus is the Messiah. 
You know, when you look at the language, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light, you look at the Greek, it has a little bit different meaning. So the word the has more meaning to it in the Greek. It's pointing to something specific. It's pointing to Jesus Christ. It's not Jesus is a way or, you know, he's a possible way or he's one of the ways. It is the only way. The definite article, V, means only. It points to a specific thing. And this particular passage is pointing to Jesus. You know, when Peter answered this question, he was really answered for all the disciples when he said uh, Jesus was the Messiah. And he's basing it on their personal relationship with Jesus. He wasn't basing the answer on the scripture. And he wasn't basing the answer on what the scribes and the Pharisees said, they were basing it on their personal experience. All through scripture, we see that the disciples had a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. A lot of one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. They had that personal relationship. You know, we need to do the same thing. We need to have that personal relationship with Jesus. And we can do it through, I don't know, prayer, Bible study, worship here. That one-on-one -on -one time is so important. Again, it was only after they declared Jesus as the Messiah because they began to understand. It doesn't take a PhD. It really doesn't. You don't need to be a scribe or a Pharisee to understand who Jesus is. There should not be any confusion. I just don't understand. Back to Bob's song for a moment. And Bob and I were talking about this earlier this morning. The song has many names for Jesus. Master, Redeemer. Savior of the world, counselor, provider, friend, door to heaven, Lord. And the Bible references over 50 different names for Jesus. There's about a thousand different references to his character of Jesus and God. And sometimes these are called names. And this was not meant to confuse at all. It's just that God is so great. God is so wonderful that he's indescribable. 2 Corinthians says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. All these names and characteristics are based upon the fact that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Make no mistake about it. Make no mistake. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind, which we must be saved. Do not be confused. So what does this mean to you and me? What does it mean to us today? God's asking you this question. He's asking me this question. The most important question ever asked of mankind. You know, for those of you who have taken that first step and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, amen. It, it's, it's the best decision, the most important decision you ever made in your life. But who else do you say Jesus is? Who else? You know, this answer should evolve as we grow in our faith. It affects how we live our lives and what we are dependent on. Jesus says, I am come that they may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. You know, Christian, you've acknowledged and accepted the eternal life that Jesus Christ offers. Your eternity is secure. Nothing can ever take that away from you. But I look at this congregation today, and for myself as well, and I know some of the hardships and joys that you've been through this year. Some of you have been through the loss of a loved one, like my sister and I and Brenda. Some of you have had diseases that you've been healed of. Some of you are still struggling with some of those things. But the Lord is there for you. You've experienced God maybe this year in a way like you never have before. But are you declaring this? Are you declaring Jesus as your helper? As your comforter? As your helper in time of need? As your friend? Are you acknowledging and declaring the abundant life of Jesus? Are you shouting it from the mountaintops? Are you resolved to claim 
what Jesus has to offer. Who do you say Jesus is? Scripture calls us to declare it with our mouths. Don't sit on the sidelines. Be joyful and be thankful. Tell the world who Jesus is. Be the witness God calls us to be. Now, a few more facts here, guys. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as the Messiah, the Savior of the world, my heart aches for you. I mourn for you. God mourns for you. You know, Scripture tells us there's two paths. There's two ways. I mean, there's only two. There's a path and there's a way through Jesus Christ that leads to salvation and eternal life with God. Just a wonderful path and a wonderful way. The other path leads to eternal destruction and separation from God. There's no middle ground there. There are only two ways. Let me encourage you today, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to take this beginning step, the step that leads to a true understanding of who Jesus is, a step of a personal relationship. Move it from your head to your heart. You know, Romans 3.23 tells us that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The scripture says all of us. I'm not exempt from that. Our sinful nature, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It also tells us that the wages of sin is death. You know, the penalty, there's a price to pay for that, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So by me accepting that eternal gift, I am exempt from the death. I'm not exempt from the sin. I'm sinful by nature. But God takes my sin. He takes the punishment. He pays the wage for that. Again, Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and justify. It is with your mouth that you profess, that you profess faith and are saved. Who do you say Jesus is? You know, there's about oh, 12 hours left to make a New Year's resolution. So it's about 12 hours, 12 hours and 10 minutes, actually. And remember, resolution is just a strong determination. It's a resolve. It's a declaration. It's a decision. Friend, here's the bottom line. I know I don't sound near as good as Bob, and I never will be. But it's important for me to declare to you that Jesus is my Lord, he's my Savior, he's my Redeemer, he's my helper in time of need, and he's my comforter. What about you? Is Jesus your Lord? Or is he somebody else's Lord? Is he your Savior? Or is he somebody else's Savior? What are you declaring? I'm going to close with Psalms 105.1. It says, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. What's your New Year's resolution? Who do you say Jesus is? Let me close this in prayer. Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for the salvation that you give us and offer through Jesus Christ. And I thank you for my salvation, Lord, and I pray I pray for those who don't know you, Lord, that they're on a path that leads to destruction, that, that you'll speak to them today. And Lord, I pray for those who do know you, that they will experience the abundant life, the, the life that's so full and overflowing that you have to offer and that we'll claim that and make it part of our lives. And we just love you so much and we thank you for Jesus. And I call on you, Lord, today. And it's his precious name we pray.